The News Hour with Jim Lehrer has been your trusted source of news for more than 26 years. And this week, for the News Hour Spotlight City series, Channel 9 and the News Hour team have hosted several community forums in the St. Louis area, moderated by News Hour correspondents Paul Salmon, Judy Woodruff, Spencer Michaels, and Gwen Eiffel. Tonight, we're bringing you the Science Forum at the Danforth Plant Science Center, moderated by Judy Woodruff. Delighted to be back in St. Louis. Uh, I love uh, the uh, the people of St. Louis, so this is a real treat for me, and I'm pleased uh, to be here as part of the News Hour's coverage of St. Louis. So we are honored to have this distinguished uh, group with us tonight to talk about uh, a science that does not get enough attention, uh, in my opinion. Why should we even be having this conversation about plant science in the year 2009? Agriculture, like medicine, is a science-based undertaking. And if you don't advance the science, you don't advance what you're doing. We all are existing because of farms. We all eat food. We need food. We, need, we want food that's cheap and safe. And uh, we need to have a sustainable agriculture. And right now, we don't have a sustainable agriculture. We're using too much fresh water. We're using too much fertilizer, which pollutes rivers and streams. We are gradually taking more and more far farmland out of production for roads and uh, cities and, and urban development. And the world population is growing. Population in the United States is growing and uh, will continue to grow for some time. We have to grow more food per acre if we're going to uh, feed our people and if we're going to preserve the land we have to do it with less inputs less water less energy input less fertilizers and we need to uh, uh, do that through innovations and the innovations will come from agricultural science but, but part of this, Judy, is, is, to, um, is to assure that, that the scientists who make the discoveries see that their knowledge could be relevant. They also know that society is the one that will accept or reject the technology. And so the knowledge base is critically important. Once that connection is made between the scientist and what he can do with his discovery and the will to be entrepreneurial or put together, there are a subset of individuals that will take that chance. But... <laughs> But give the scientists their head. Give them the opportunity to, to be involved and knowing what market wants. It's that interface that's terribly important right now. And, and when we do that and pull out some entrepreneurism, uh, just as in the biomedical field, we find it happening in the plant sciences as well. Is there a role yeah. for Washington in all this? We think there, there are great opportunities in, uh, in plant science for investment. And we would urge everyone, hurry, hurry, hurry. Get them on the ground floor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there, there, are, there are great opportunities for Washington. Scientists have been recommending reform since 1972, and nothing much has happened. And now is a great opportunity to bring the standards of agricultural research up to the same level as the standards of medical research. Ted Medlin, is this something that's discussed by farmers themselves? With respect to how government may play a, a direct role in this sort of thing, I think uh, something that needs very careful examination, uh, particularly with respect to nonprofits, is uh, how we're moving along in the tax arena. Nonprofits should still be in the same category that they've been. Uh, they should not have that, that advantage eroded because the scientists here do need that support. The whole industry needs it. What Ted Medlin said, Derek Rapp, I'm going to turn to you next. Some of what I think he's referring to is the government supporting farmers, supporting agriculture. But there's a connection to science as well, isn't there? Uh, it requires, as, as Bill mentioned, we need to see new innovation that leads to the agricultural productivity increases that will continue to uh, meet the demand. Uh, Quite simply, the numbers, uh, world population uh, is growing at about 1.2% annually. Meanwhile, 
uh, arable land, farm, farmable land, is decreasing worldwide at about 0.3 percent annually. So we need to increase agricultural productivity about a point and a half a year simply to tread water. And that's before you take into consideration factors such as changing of diets around the world that lead to increased consumption of grains because of increased consumptions of meat, et cetera. What are some examples of the kinds of advances that are over the near horizon? Well, I, th I think, sorry, Go one ahead, example yeah. uh, that is uh, uh, creating a great deal of excitement right now is drought-tolerant crops, uh, crops that will uh, require less water uh, and therefore that does a few things. One, uh, an acre of land that's already being farmed will uh, not demand as much water. And two, it might bring some land that currently may be marginal back into, uh, uh, into farmability. And the, the second opportunity is um, new planting equipment will put the fertilizer exactly where it ought to be. There will be less requirement for nitrogen-based fertilizers. That, that's a good thing, uh, less water, less inputs, less fertilizers. So agriculture is changing through knowledge that, uh, of, of how basic processes work. How do they take up water? How do they take up fertilizer? And how can they defend themselves against diseases? We think it's important here, but yet the science has to underlie both what we do and what might happen in other parts of the world. Victoria Gonzalez, you work uh, with entrepreneurs who are coming up with ideas, and you work on supporting them. Tell us about some of the work you see going on right now and why it's so important to support it. Well, yeah, Derek's a great example. His, his company is working on technology that will prevent um, nematode-resistant type um, technology that will increase yields. And, you know, it is so important for these kinds of companies to have resources relative to capital, uh, relative to having the regulatory and the intellectual property knowledge and talent to, so that they can get through that for commercialization. So companies in this area, I'll tell you, we don't, we don't have as many venture capital companies who are putting their money towards agricultural type technologies, and it's so important. Why is that? Us. Why is that the case? You know, people don't think of this field as science. And so I don't know that there has been, you know, number one, a lot of return for some of the venture capital who have gotten in that field. Um, but I think it's also, I think we're just getting into exploring um, opportunities, for example, nutrition. Um, so plants that have nutritional value uh, for people. Uh, growing pharmaceuticals or creating pharmaceuticals in plants. And so we're seeing new opportunities that I think we will see now more venture capital coming into this area. But, but historically, there haven't been those high-tech opportunities for the venture capital to put money in. So the, the next uh, what we call evergreen revolution is going to have to come through science and improved technologies. And the technologies will be in the seeds. And uh, we'll, that's how we'll preserve a good world for our great-grandkids. If, if the entrepreneurs have not seen enough reason over the past decades to invest in, uh, well, in some of these and I would challenge projects that and ideas. Okay, and well then that, let's Just hear. to say that there are several new venture capital funds that have been formed in the last decade that are focused particularly in agriculture. What Vicky said is exactly right. And that is that uh, historically we've seen a lot more funds focused on pharmaceuticals or uh, medical devices, et cetera, within the life sciences arena overall. But there is an increasing focus within agriculture. But we need to see more firms, certainly. Well, and how do you make that happen? Oh. I mean, is it something... We succeed as companies and uh, show them that uh, this is an exciting opportunity in part. So they say, you know, I, I look at that fund that invested in that company and... Uh, and received a payoff several times its investment, and uh, now I see that other companies are being formed in this area, and I want to I have that kind of success too. In this whole area of, of uh, plant science and biotech, including the regulatory and, and intellectual property issues that have to be addressed to um, start a new business in this area, and um, you know, what we are focused on is getting entrepreneurs excited about that opportunity here in the area and also attracting capital and corporate partners to start participating in that. 
is it that agriculture is kind of the stepchild of, of science? Is that, is that what's happened here? I, th I think the funding opportunities make it a stepchild. What do you mean the funding opportunities? Um, if you're a graduate student and you're looking at where next you want to make your impact, uh, you may find that it's greater to make an impact in engineering or in medicine. It's a little more difficult to, uh, to say that you want to spend your life in plant science research, perhaps a hundred to one ratio between success and getting a grant in the, in the desk compared to the plant sciences. Where would you, if you're an intelligent, bright, young person, we hope they will in fact, this will in fact draw new young people. It, what would you add to that, uh, Ted Medlin? I'm coming back to you because you're, you're the one who said farmers may not sit around every day thinking about <laughs> science. What is it about this area that, that the rest of the country could learn from? The importance of this institution cannot be overstated. It demands our support. It demands our spirits. It demands our all. We, uh, no better case could be made for uh, providing a strong agricultural system in the U.S. than just to look at uh, our recent uh, catastrophe with our dependency on foreign energy. And it affected all of us. Uh, certainly in agriculture, we saw our input costs escalate tremendously. So we have to preserve a strong agricultural system in the U.S. for our own security and for the security of others around the world. Thank you. Well, it, it's a great, not only a great spot. I think you should, I think you should hire. <laughs> <laughs> How important is it, Dr. Beachy, to, to keep that connection with folks who are farming today in this country? Or is this global affecting countries all over the planet that you have to set your sights not only in the United States but beyond as well? There are global questions and the global problems that farmers here face. The issue of water uh, as a limited resource faces all farmers. How do you get more crop per drop? Um, the, the issues of, of um, saving the environment and and using less energy while doing so faces the farmer in Africa as well as the farmer that's here. It's our social responsibility to use the knowledge that would be impactful for, let's say, American um, vegetable farmers in ways that would benefit those in Africa and Asia. Um, knowledge is knowledge, and, and cells are cells. So that basic information is, is critical. There's clearly been dollars focused in the stimulus package, Victoria, but not for agriculture. Why do, why do we think that is? The short answer well, yeah. or the long one? Yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. Dr. Danforth. I've spent, spent a lot of time, of time on that. And I, I, let, let me say that uh, in the stimulus package, the National Institutes of Health got an extra $10 billion dollars uh, enormous increase. The National Science Foundation got three billion and agricultural got zero. And one of the reasons was that um, people from the Office of Management and Budget, the OMV, argued against giving any to agriculture for fear that the money might be wasted. And that is, as I've said, there needs to be a reform in the way in which money is spent, federal monies are spent in agricultural research. We can't make the world 100% safe. I used to tell students, parents from Washington University, you can worry about your kid, but if you really want to worry, the most dangerous thing is the automobile. And that's true for most of us. But people get, go up ballistic if they think a new food might have something in it that uh, they don't know about before. And the risk to that has proved over the uh, years that we've had genetically modified crops, there hasn't been one case, not one case of harm to a human being. There has not been one demonstrated case of harm to the environment. So I think we can begin to relax and streamline the regulations, but it's going to take some political will. But, th but that it was a real concern that was out there has, sure. and still is out there. Yeah. It, it's a, it, but the concern is in, in the eye of the accuser. We don't know how to do risk assessment very well in agriculture. And until we do, it's easy to throw darts. Uh, it's been estimated that there, one, there have been more than 1.5 billion meals consumed 
that contain genetically modified foods. Mm -hmm. And not one incident of medical uh, impact, no allergies, no toxicities, and no harm to the environment. So, Is it your feeling that there is real competition for research dollars between the plant sciences, agriculture, and the other sciences? Mm -hmm. Certainly within the private sector. I do think that there is some market inefficiency uh, as pertaining to the perception of the attractiveness of, on the one hand, pharmaceuticals, and on the other hand, agriculture. How about at research federal, sponsored by the government? At the yeah. federal level, I would say there is not competition you know, between medical and agricultural research. There tends to be more competition between agricultural research and, and uh, farm subsidies and uh, food stamps and other things that are handled by the same committee. And those are tough, uh, tough decisions. But um, agricultural research... You mean the Committee of Congress? It's a committee they're handled by the same congressional committees, appropriations subcommittees in Congress. And uh, those are tough decisions to make. But um, in my view, um, it doesn't make any sense that the National Institutes of Health spends... Uh, well, it used to be 14 now it's probably $20 in research for every dollar spent on agricultural research is just totally out of whack. And uh, I think that needs to be corrected with more resources going into agricultural research. I'd hate to take it out of medical research, but it has to come from somewhere, I, was I guess. I ask, who's going who's who's to be making it? that decision? And, and, uh, That'll be and made by the, well, that's made by rec on recommendation by the OMB and the uh, and the White House develops the budget and then Congress responds. But it sounds to as that. if you're saying you don't think that's going to happen in the near future, or am I hearing you correctly? No, I, I think I'm optimistic because I think the first step is to prove that by the USDA that agricultural research can be and is being well managed. I think it's easy to make the case for more resources if people are confident that they'll be well spent. I mean, the needs are so great, and it's easy to sit down. I hope we've convinced people tonight, but it's pretty easy if you sit down with uh, uh, a congressman or a senator to convince them of the importance. I think there are some opportunities in agriculture, and agriculture will change in the next 20 or 25 years. But the Midwest is filled with tens of thousands and millions of acres of prime farmland that is well suited for this larger scale farmer, for farming, for corn and, and wheat and, and soybeans. To lose that would, would be a tragedy in the Midwest because it's a large part of the economy. So I think we need to be looking ahead at, at asking ourselves and having the U.S. Department of Agriculture help us to solve the problem of what will agriculture look like in 25 years when it might be cheaper to import certain things into the U.S. than to grow it on our expensive land. What might be the next crops that we should be growing that would have higher value? Maybe these are crops that will have things like polymers for plastics or fibers or, or new uses. All the chemical uses that the chemical companies need to make things for us can be derived from plants. Maybe that's where we should be looking. Again, we need leadership from Washington and we need the support of the infrastructure for science to help with leading to the technology that Ted and his successors will use. Leadership in Washington is terribly important in times like these. Derek Rapp. We need to improve the economics for the grower so that uh, growing is a more attractive yeah. uh, vocation in the first place. If we can find ways to increase productivity, we hope then the grower can retain at least some of the uh, incremental revenues uh, t uh, that come as a result of the increased uh, productivity. Well, I, I take issue with that, uh, those statements for just a moment, mm -hmm. and that is that I don't think we can depend on foreign sources for our food supply. Uh, it's just not practical uh, in my mind. Uh, in 1929, the percentage of disposable income allocated to the procurement of food in the U.S. was 23 percent. Today it is somewhere between 7 and 9 percent. In Europe, it's somewhere between 15 and 30 percent. In Central Asia and Africa, it's 30 to 80 percent. In Central and South America, it's 20 to 40 percent. We have a very, very good system in place here. We are 89 percent 
food secure. It's the 11% solution that we really need to commit our minds and resources to. I, and there are opportunities that, that will help people in, in other countries be successful because their agriculture can export. Just as our economy in the U.S. has benefited by a 60 to $80 billion sur uh, sur surplus that we sell overseas, we'll also need to be, I think, receiving something from outside. That's the way the balance should work in, in many, of us, uh, many of our minds. So we do have some differences, but at the end, uh, we are still wanting a strong agriculture here. But a strong agriculture in Africa will be a help. And if that strong agriculture, Ted, means that we uh, sell less to Cuba or less to, to South America in the future than we do now because of their own productivity, then we need to be prepared for what our agriculture will be. That was the point of them. Let me just uh, begin to wrap up this, this really interesting, fascinating conversation with a question about what you look for. I mean, is this, you know, we have a new president uh, who's been in office about 100 days now. What do you look for in terms of leadership from Washington, leadership right here in your own community to promote the plant sciences and to promote science across the board, which is, I think, arguably a part of our fabric, a part of our economy that has just not received the kind of focus in our schools uh, and in our society that it deserves. I'd, I'd love to hear from all of you on that question. You want to start, Victoria? Oh. From a commercialization standpoint, I think there's so much that can be done. Um, you know, a lot of what we've heard about are shovel-ready opportunities, and to me that's buildings and roads. Um, and and I, I will tell you, facilities are very critical to um, new startup companies because they want to be putting money towards their technology, not having to pay high rents and buy equipment, et cetera. So, I'm not, so those are important. But I think equally important are other types of infrastructure opportunities of you know, being able to attract people, having um, mechanisms where... Um, you know, uh, there's opportunities to put capital back into very early stage um, uh, companies in science. And I think finding ways to promote more research at the university level and also, you know, looking at how we can promote science, um, our kids in our high schools to be pursuing science careers. Is, is so critical. And I don't know what the answer is, but I think it needs to be very high top of the agenda. Derek? Well, I'm glad that Vicki mentioned education because at least when we think about a long-term solution, uh, that has to be one of the major considerations, one of the major components here. I, I think in the nearer term, uh, helping the general public get comfortable with the, the presence of technology uh, in many facets of life, uh, and therefore, yes, it's in our food too, uh, is uh, again something that will lead to a greater appreciation of the inputs that are going into agriculture. Y you mentioned, uh, is plant science a, a stepchild? And it may be uh, perceived that way, but not for those who are in the field of plant science. For people in this field, I think there is tremendous passion because we appreciate the compelling aspects of the work that's going on. Well, what comment would you make wrapping this up? Dr. Oh, I just agree with everything that people have been saying. I think the, uh, we, we do need to um, do a good job of working with the American people and our great democracy to understand that science is not scary. It's just a way of, uh, of providing better understanding about the world so that you can move things ahead. And uh, I think we need to uh, work very hard on our early education, K through 12 education, and teaching people, young kids, math and science. And we need to encourage more uh, of our bright young people to going into teaching. And my bias is we need to reward our K through 12 teachers better. If you want to make a fair amount of money, you don't go into K through 12 teaching. And um, 
we need them very much there. I think we need more bright young people in teaching than we do in policy making. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, I'm, people uh, agree with you. Uh, we, they are the heroes mm -hmm. of our society to come. We need to be very careful, thoughtful, wise, insightful in the courses that we set before us. We shouldn't jeopardize effective infrastructure, successful infrastructure, to build infrastructure. All right, and Dr. Beachy, this is, this is your uh, center here. What is, what is your message uh, in terms of, uh, and from the center of the country, in order to supporting the sciences and in particular the plant? Um, I'll just make, uh, it, it, these, these other comments have been perfect and they've said the things that should, have been, should also have been said. What I would add to that is that we have great expect, expectations in, uh, in, from Washington now because we have a president and administration who, folk, who's, who says science is important. His transition team had lots of scientists on it. He's making, he's hiring people and bringing people in that, that are very bright. I think having a, an administration that recognizes the importance of science in setting policy, whether the policy is for roads and healthcare or, 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 edu or uh, education or in research is terribly important. That's a nice change for many of us. And we look forward to Washington being different if it makes its policies based on science. Knowing that Congress is not full of scientists, we don't know how far one individual or a group of scientists can help, but we're looking for change. All right, on that note, we're gonna thank our panelists uh, for this discussion. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.